Hello everyone, this is Glenn. Um, I'm doing a a Mud Flood Australia video. Um, this is, uh, I suppose, one of the first. I wanted to draw your attention to this particular um, a map. This is a map by Maslin from a book called Friends of Australia 1830. And Maslin is a, a former uh, East India uh, merchant and he has prepared this plan with uh, another character uh, I can't remember the name, Sturt or someone, um, but anyway, he's, he's, this map was drawn in about 1829, 1827 I think this was, and it was apparently a joke because it's, it's a famous Australian inland sea. Now we have lots of maps that are, that are, you know, people don't take seriously about you know, land in the North Pole and possibly maps that are there as a ruse to, to get people to crash their ships in the wrong location. and this kind of thing. Well, this one, this this map is based on a former um, French map, so it's got accurate coastlines. Um, there was a map done quite well in the early 1800s by, I think, a French cartographer. Um, and so that's the where the coast comes from. And this inland sea, I've outlined it here, but um, it, this is, a, this is a, a modernized map. They've put in extra blue touches and make it more effective. It wasn't on the original map. It was just um, gray and white. So um, what they think is a joke is that they spent um, Sturt or someone um, spent a lot of time trying to find the land sea, and they and he wrote an entire book um, that discussed it. Now, this was this initially um, triggered my attention that we are truly um, going in the wrong tangent. Um, some things are cons, some things are misdirected, but uh, a lot of the people at the time spent a great deal of effort trying to find this inland sea. Now. Just before I go on, um, this, this is going to lead into a bit of a long-term rabbit hole and this is really, um, when we talk about mud flood, we're probably talking about um, mud flood north um, hemisphere and probably the inverse in the southern hemisphere, the great dry, the dry out, and I think I've got a good theory for that. And it leads me, this is, so this is, the, this is around 1827, the book was written in 1829, um, published in 1830 in London. Um, so this is the map of Australia, roughly the same scale. Um, now what I find interesting is, as you can see, now if we could zoom into Google Earth, but I won't for this video, you can do it yourself. Um, so, so this area here, and this island here particularly, um, uh, would compare very well to whatever's here. Okay, so um, if you, if, and then of course we know that if you zoom in, you see all sorts of dry earth all the way along here. You see a lot of like fracked earth or things that look like it's been um, slewed or it's, a, it's, a, it's been washed and mined um, somehow in the distant distant past, we think. Or maybe it's not so distant. The um, First of all, uh, I just want to draw your attention to this um, red spot. You can zoom in on Google Earth yourself anytime and you'll find that it is uniquely in that location. It's quite precise. So this isn't perfect at scale, but if I just um, do this and this, uh, and just go copy, and just go down and paste, as I say, it's not perfectly at scale. All right, so um, you'll see that we'll get a bit of a, right, like you're trying to match it up to that point there. Look, it, it's, it's quite close. You'll find that a lot of these river systems will roughly match something. There's a lot of mess if you close close up in terms of old river beds and stuff. I mean, they could have also gotten it wrong. Even if they, if in, even if it was an inland sea, this could be kind of up here if you think, and that could be, you know, if you if you sort of you know, um, change it around a bit, move that down there and sort of skew that up, you know, you might be able to, uh, you know, get something that kind of, you know, is similar. You can play around. It's probably what we're talking about here, and I think that it would roughly align with that um, edge there, which seems like the edge of a you know, sort, of, sort of watermark, really. Okay, so that got me onto the Batavia, and the Batavia is um, the Batavia is a famous shipwreck of Western Australia. It was um, uh, 1629 or whatever, but then it was shipwrecked in the 1600s. Uh, and it's, they, they go on about it because it was uh, it's put, uh, shipwrecked in such a place that it preserved and the Western Australian Museum has done a great video but this is really important that we listen to a few of this and this is courtesy of um, uh, Western Australian Museum 
I'm going to just see if I can play it from the correct position so you can get an idea. This polar forest that he found. Um, I'm just going and to the next, sorry. looking for wood that had fallen down in the forest of Poland. And then all of a sudden, all these paintings, they snapped into this polar forest that he found. Um, and then they could just. So, just so we don't spend all the time in the video, you can see it yourself Mysteries of Batavia. Earlier on, she's referenced that this is double laid wood, high quality wood, very high quality, far beyond the resources we put in the ship today. And they use an enormous amount of wood, and they're talking about this particular ship and where the, the wood came from. Established that it came from this Polish forest. What is interesting is that of this particular forest, not a single piece of wood has been found after 1643. Nothing, not a single piece. And whereas before that, it was very common. And art historians have been saying for the last 30 years that it must have been tied to shipbuilding and that the Dutch but also other European nations would have used so much of this really fine quality nice oak for shipbuilding that by the time of 1643 there was nothing left and it was all gone. Um, we have no archives that could have confirmed that from um, from, from the Dutch libraries or from the Dutch East India Company libraries because the Dutch East India Company um, archives of the early 17th century are incomplete. And those things that would have given us a lot of information on wood trade are simply missing. So looking at the Batavia wood and all of a sudden realizing that this wood also came from the same forest that um, would have of which the timber was used by those painters all of a sudden made us realize that the Dutch East India Company probably had a huge influence on depleting those forests. Um, given the fact that they would build several ships a year um, for many years on a row and this particular way of constructing ships with... Okay, so what I want to pick up from this is that there's incomplete records. Though for the British East India Company then they're quite complete. That's interesting. The um, other thing you want to pick up is that um, you, you, they, the, the forest eventually run out. There's nothing left. So you're stuck now with well, where else are they going to get the wood from? Um, and this is one of the interesting things you've got to start thinking about is a potential source of wood, which I think makes sense, would be... I'll just type it in here while I'm here. Um, Let's go. And cedar. Caps lock off, sorry. Um, okay, so you're going to get a lot of red cedar. Uh, oh, sorry. Anyway, whatever it is. I don't know. Oh, God, for God, please, love me, God. Alright, so Australian red cedar, it's obviously all around the north. Um, uh, the north and the uh, east coast of Australia it could have been the northwest. There's certainly large trees in in in, um, uh, in Western Australia. So there is a um, uh, Western Australia giant trees. Oops. There is um, the Valley of the Giant Trees top walk. You can look at that. It's a national park proving that there's. They even got Valley of the Giants Denmark Western Australia tree top walk. But what do you know? It, there you go. Okay, so one of the things that I'm thinking is as a potential theory is that uh, the the Dutch needed wood. They obviously did everything they can to get it, and Western Australia would have been the perfect place for it. And if you um, look here, uh, there's probably a very quick and easy to learn science where if you take out the major trees on the edge, just like you did in California, and you mine some of the inside, you create such an ecological disaster. You could have done it in the late Middle Ages. Could have done it in the 1700s, and there'll be nothing left of anything. It'll have a flow-on effect, which will eventually destroy everything. Um, that we see down here, the salt lakes here. All this is around the gold fields. This we're told is 30,000 years old, or whatever it is. It could have been what 300 years old, or 200 years old, or 150 years old. So we don't know until we do the research ourselves. Okay, so going back to Maslin and his and um, this this guy that apparently was so he wrote a book that was so epic. 481 pages, or you know, whatever it is actually, it's, uh, I'm not sure what it is, but uh, okay, so it's it's called Friends, A Friend of Australia, a plan for exploring the interior, he had visions of 
grandeur of how to, how to uh, organize city is amazing. You'll see references in this book about Indian traders. He refers to the Australian Aborigines as throwing spears as Indians and cannibals. He also refers to Indian traders. So this is strange because he's, he's conflating. He says oh, he's obviously racist. He's a white Indian, I think. I'm not sure. But he's racist and he's, and he's elitist. He's a, certainly a monarchist, and you can see it in his tone. Um, a lot of interesting things like um, a perpetual warfare exists between the Malays, who visit the north and northwest coast of Australia, and the uh, Maregas, or savages of these coasts, who we are formed are generally an athletic, muscular race, displaying a considerable share of courage and more cunning when firearms are out of view. And as they cannot discriminate between Europeans and Malays, it would be difficult. Okay, interesting. They can't discriminate between you. Okay. Well, um, Maregas. Uh, oh, it's, I'll have to research that. It's probably more Negroid. Um, we do know that the DNA of North. Western Aborigines have a large percentage of Dravidian. A Dravidian, obviously, is a rich and ancient DNA source that includes Africa and southern India. So that's some interesting thoughts there. Um, so just want to bring that, that to your attention. So there is a lot more in Australia we don't know. Australia does have uh, aspects that we could be looking at the wrong tree. We could be thinking, you know, um, some people think Huguenot, some people think uh, Starfort, some people think Dataria. I mean, we're probably dealing with something where you're dealing with a what was mud flood in the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere was resource grabbing. And when I look through these notes in this book, you get a, you get the sense that they knew that there was whalers all through the area, French whalers, Polynesian whalers, who would trade in oil, and who would obviously go to ports. And you got ports all written reference through all of this book. It says. There's this port after port, which means that the ship can stop. Doesn't mean that there's a city. It might be a city, it might be a town, it might be just a shanty. We have a few traders and a, and, a, and a prostitute and a drunk and who knows. Maybe that's all it is. And maybe that's the start of these towns. Maybe we're overstating it. Um, there, there is, um, when I go through this and I go through some of the other things he references, if you go to the, um, you know, it's funny enough, I mean, I'm a bit of a nerd sometimes, but I sometimes go to the bibliography and see all the maps and all these paintings and these things. They're kind of nice. Um, but the his bibliography talks about there's some amazing stuff. Um, and maybe oh, there's this, there's, a, there's a, yeah. um, let's have a look. Sorry. Okay. The Asiatic Journal Monthly Register of British Foreign... Yeah, these Asiatic journals are so boring to look at, but really, you get the idea that... I was reading an Asiatic journal, uh, and they're made, and, and they're published from in the 1820s in, in India or somewhere, and uh, it constantly references things. Like, it says, um, oh, yes, we set up a, a settlement in Swan River, and, you, and it's the date's 1820-something. It's roughly in line with the official narrative. But then you go and say, okay, um, it it doesn't, it mentions in these records and that, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, we found um, um, there was like 11 ships turned up and only three were British or something. And I said, well, hang on, what were the other ships then? Um, one of the things is that you have to see what they don't write. This is what's bizarre. It, that they that they talk about Indian traders. What does that mean? Obviously, yeah. Let's let's have a quick look at what. Let's look at the. Um, uh, let's look at something that's really East India Indian ship. So, what is an Indian trader? Yeah, you just go to Wikipedia. East Indian Wikipedia. It refers to these ships and it refers to how the British and everyone else had to use the Indian manufactured ships because the Indians were so great at being good sailors and they were so great at shipbuilding. Isn't that great? So it wasn't the British that were so good at shipbuilding. Um, oh, here we go. Making use of Indian shipbuilding techniques accrued by Indians, their holes of Indian teak being especially suitable for local waters. So you have this Indian company called the East India Trading Company of Indian things you've got you can reference other amazing things about Indians like there's a whole book I just found, found recently um, discussing oh, 
God, it's a whole book about the maritime history of, of, of India. I've just started reading it. So basically what we could be dealing with is a complete um, sleight of hand. We don't even get any os aspect of the truth. It's not, it's not even to do with Tartaria. It's not even to do with anything. It could even just to do with the fact is that we had several nations. We can, we, I cannot easily find French maritime records. Dutch maritime records are tough. Swedish maritime records. Um, there's a lot of ships that came from Hamburg. And eventually the names of towns of of Adelaide, for example, changed from German to, to English over time. So the, the, the history is complicated. Is it possible that the manufacturing of these Dutch ships, these massive things, um, these huge things that took an enormous amount of wood and making what three or four a year was what devastated the popul um and, and the gold mining of course they did basic cut and, and water and wash water and wash um, gold mining would have been the thing so that would have been devastating for the environment they wouldn't have known the impact overall from clearing massive trees if you if you even go to and look at the um uh, if you go to this area, as I say, and you start looking at the National Park here, um, apparently there's a National Park area here, Prince Regent National Park, so that would be somewhere roughly where um, the Dutch would have had gone to get their wood. You'll find tree stump evidence, major, major trees, large superstructures. I don't think they were cut down by the Dutch, but it gives you an indication that the area had large trees. So, food for thought, I think we're dealing with an ecological disaster in Australia, not a mud flood. I think it's the inverse. And I think that the origin of all of these, um, we need to give more credit to the civilizations here interacting with Australia in initially and having some leverage with the power, superpowers that are looking for extra resources. I don't think the superpowers cared about Australia. I think that they'd use it as a, as, a, as a means to an end. And I think that the Dutch ships would go this way because, to, to Hobart Town for the past 200 years in, in New Zealand because they could get um, the whalers and the whale oil was highly sought after as a form of oil and soap and that's what they were doing. They were trying to trade up. That's where all the interest is. So I think that that's what you've got to start thinking about. So that's it for now. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, that's it.